Well, good morning. We are finishing up our study of Romans chapter 13, and we'll be doing the next couple chapters over the following weeks, and hopefully we'll be all done by Easter. And so thanks for hanging out with us these past couple months going through uh, Romans. I know it's been, uh, it's, been a, it's been a long book to study, uh, but I'm going to start in the book of Zechariah, and we're going to be in chapter 3. This is Zechariah's vision. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the Lord, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. Zechariah has a vision of Joshua. He is the high priest, and he's standing before what the Bible says is the angel of the Lord. Satan is also there. We know him, but who is the angel of the Lord? If you look at some other verses in the Bible, we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. You, you tell me what you think. Genesis 16 says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar. The angel speaks as God himself in the first person. And in this verse, in uh, 13, Hagar identifies that the Lord had spoke to her as the God who sees. In Genesis 22, the angel of the Lord appears to Abraham and refers to himself as God in the first person. In Exodus 3, the angel of the Lord appears to Moses in a flame. And in verse 2, it says that God speaks to Moses from the flame. In verse 4, both instances refer to himself in the first person, and the text seemingly conflates the two as one. Numbers 22, the angel of the Lord meets the prophet Balaam in the road. In verse 38, Balaam identifies the angel who spoke to him as delivering the word of God. So this angel of the Lord is the physical, human, representation of God on earth. In other words, that would be Jesus, right? So in Zachariah's vision, Jesus and Satan stand before God, and it feels like it's a courtroom scene. Joshua is pictured as being in filthy garments, and currently Joshua has served as high priest for this small remnant of Israel who had returned from Babylonian captivity, and Satan is acting as the prosecuting attorney. And he says that the priesthood is so polluted that there's no acceptable sacrifice that they could offer to God that would wipe away their sins, and he hurls his accusations. Satan's case is that the Jews might as well not even rebuild the temple. They might as well give up and no longer be God's people. But Satan's effort to accuse Joshua and discredit him as high priest, it fails. Because the Bible says the angel of the Lord removes the filthy garments Joshua was wearing and clothes him with rich robes and a clean turban. That turban would have had a gold inscription above it that says, holy is the Lord. The angel of the Lord, which in the Old Testament is Jesus, prior to his incarnation on earth, orders that new robes be given, and he says, Behold, I have taken away your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. Who alone has the authority to take away sins? Only Jesus. I thought that story was pretty interesting, because Jesus doesn't ask Joshua any questions, and he doesn't ask him to defend himself. Jesus before there's any accus accusations, simply says, I forgive you, I wash you clean, and I make you new. Last week, I showed you a picture of what kids look like back in the 1980s. But 
to be fair, that's really what the preppy kids wore. That is not what I wore. I looked more like this. Yes, long hair, a rock band shirt, bandanas, bracelets, and parachute pants. Sadly, I did not get a pair of parachute pants my freshman or sophomore year. I think I got mine in my junior or senior year, just as they were going out of style. I might have been the last kid at my school to get a pair. I really needed Jesus in that moment to come along and say, here kid, you need some new clothes. Another example of my uh, Generation X life one of my favorite TV shows growing up was a show called The Greatest American Hero. Uh, William Catt played a school teacher who was given the superhero suit from outer space and it gave him Superman-like powers. Unfortunately, he lost the instruction manual for how the suit worked and much of the show was just watching him fumble and try to help others at the same time as to learn his uh, new powers. I bring this up because the closing uh, paragraph of Romans 13 talks about our own superhero suit. Right at the bottom, verse 14 says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. You and I have been given an incredible superhero suit as well. And verse 14 tells us exactly how to dress ourselves. And all the verses leading up to it, they explain all the character and power that comes to us when we choose to put Jesus on. Look at the very first superpower. Verse 8 says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. That's your first superhero power, love. The word for love there in the Greek is the word agape. Out of the four or five Greek words for love that we translate into English, agape is the word that's used to express a unselfish and overwhelming love the same love that God shows us. With agape love, Jesus put aside all his rights as God. He took upon flesh, he became human, and then he went even further in that he dies a horrible death on the cross and he pays for our sins. So agape love is also sacrificial. It means that you place somebody else's needs above your own. Walden Church, shows agape love through our Stephen ministers, through our grief share program, through Joy Squad, through Helping Hands. Once again, here in Romans, we see Paul repeating the words of Jesus. Matthew 22, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Elsewhere, in Galatians 5, it says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love is our biggest superpower. And it's first and foremost. That's what it means to be a Christian. Love is job number one. That's what it means to follow Christ. The Bible says that God chose us in love and we should be rooted and grounded in love. That we should bear with one another in love. That we should speak the truth in love. As a church, we are building up the body of Christ in love and walking in love. Is love a superpower? Yes, it is. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Does that sound possible? No, it does not, right? It sounds impossible. It sounds next to impossible. That's why it's a superpower. And God's love says that we should have that same love that he gives us for all people. Yes, even the very difficult people. Yes, even people who do not agree with us. Jesus said, even people who hate you, 
Jesus said, even your enemy. We Christians are called to love as God loves us, which of course is impossible, or yet it would be, if we didn't have God's love covering us. It would be impossible if we weren't clothed in Jesus. What's another power that we have clothed in Jesus? Discernment. What? Discernment? That's not as cool as love. What sort of superpower is discernment? Verse 11 says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Do you know why bad guys cannot sneak up on Superman? They can't surprise him. It's because he has x-ray vision. He can see right through walls. In fact, Superman has super hearing, so he can hear what other people are saying in the next room. Discernment is a very essential skill for Christians. It involves distinguishing between right and wrong, truth and error, good and evil. Discernment is essential because it helps us navigate all the complexities of being a Christian. All day long, you know, we're bombarded with messages from the outside world that can be confusing and deceptive, and they make it challenging for people to know what's right and wrong. Discernment enables Christians to recognize truth from lies, good from evil, to know what God's desire is. Most people, whether they're godly or not, Christians or not, spiritually mature or not, are able to watch the evening news and with some fair degree of accuracy discern, distinguish, judge what is happening in our world, whether it's good or bad. But why do we have this superpower? Why do Christians have it? And what are we supposed to do with it? Because I think the temptation for us is, oh, we use this to judge, right? We see something going on, we see evil, or we see falsehood, and we get our finger out because we're going to accuse it. But you know what Jesus says? In John 12, Jesus says, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge them, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. What a great check for spiritual discernment. What, why did Jesus come? He says, I didn't come to judge. I came to save. Why are we sharing truth? What are we discerning? What's the reason? Is it to pass judgment on someone, to tell them they're wrong, or is it to help them? Are we discerning to accuse them or to save them? What else does Jesus say? Matthew 7, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Augustine, he prayed, O oh Lord, deliver me from this lust of always vindicating myself. This is not just a teaching on judgment, but discernment. Think for a moment. What if you were on the receiving end of this discernment? How would you like to be approached by someone that you barely know, or a stranger, or even someone you do know, but you know that they don't agree with you? They've been very open about denouncing you. And they say, you know, I've discerned a lot of jealousy in your life. You know, God has told me to address your anger with you. I'm discerning that you aren't living the way that you should. How well would you receive that discernment? Not very well. Why not? Is it because of the message? Or the messenger? Because Jesus teaches that it first starts with Christians who've done the introspection of their own life 
and who've wrestled with their own sin. Why do you think Paul lists love first? Why do you think he puts love above discernment? Because love comes first. Before you can use your superpower of discernment, you first need to to display the stronger superpower of love. I understand you know the truth, and I know you want to speak the truth. I get that. There's nothing wrong with that. Christians need to speak the truth now more than ever. But Paul reminds us, even in Ephesians 4, that we are to speak the truth in love. And it starts by purifying our heart, pulling out our planks, and then building relationships that allow us, that allow us to speak to someone's life. And this applies to all of us. Paul says, you know the time, you are awake. He says, you don't walk in darkness, you walk in light. What is Paul telling us at the end of chapter 13? What does clothing ourselves in Jesus really look like? Well, first, I think we need to put love into our lives, right? Put love into our lives. Remember the context of this book, right? Remember what's going on. Paul is writing to the capital city of the Roman Empire. And believe me, love was the thing that is the most lacking. Nero was cruel, relentless. He was running a military regime. There was rampant slavery. There was immorality everywhere. Where's Paul? He's in Corinth. That is a city that is steeped in sexual immorality. Far worse and far more open than anything you and I see today. In fact, the word Corinth became a word in the Roman Empire that signified an inappropriate relationship between two people. Corinth was home to the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Her temple was situated on a hill 500 feet above the city. And in order to worship the goddess, men participated in immoral acts with the priestesses. So when Paul or Jesus says, love fulfills the law, that means when I come in contact with any person, I need to realize my first obligation is to love them. Owe nothing to anyone except to love them. Every day, every person. The Christian puts love into their loves, lives, and the Christian takes sin out of their lives. Right? The Christian puts love into their lives, and the Christian takes sin out of their lives. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. That means it's time to look around and realize that night surrounds us. There is something about the wicked age that we live in that should compel us and motivate us and drive us to get serious about our walk with Jesus, to get serious about loving others. Christians are to be light, shining in the darkness of the night. It's also time to look around us and realize that time is short. There are more gray hairs on my head every day. There is no better time to start than now. And it's time to look around and see what should not be in our lives. Paul concludes with a command to us, let us cast off the works of darkness. That means anything in my life that's incompatible with love. Anything in my life that's incompatible with Jesus. I need to remove that plank. Paul says, remove the plank, put on the armor of light. This is what happens in the vision from Zechariah. Jesus places uh, clean garments on Joshua, removes filthy garments, gives him a rich robe, And this, of course, is the symbol of Jesus dying for our sins and clothing us with righteousness. There's a beautiful verse in the Psalm, Psalm 85, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. That's the cross. Truth represents reality, right? Truth is without error. Truth is without hypocrisy. But mercy overlooks error. So in a way, truth and mercy contradict each other, but they meet together in Jesus. Again, righteousness is inflexible justice. 
Meaning, if we remain in a sinful, unrepentant state, the righteousness of God is, a, is opposed to peace on earth. But those two contradictory concepts, Psalm says they kiss. You know, the last part of the outfit Jesus puts on Joshua is the crown. Verse 5 says, let them put a turban on his head. The turban was a headdress that the high priest wore. In Exodus, it tells us there's a front placard that says, holy to the Lord. This person is holy to the Lord. The headdress is a symbolic uh, item of this relationship that this person now has with God, that this person has fellowship and closeness with God. And we see this same thing in the book of Revelation. Revelation 2.10 says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. So there's our, our prosecuting attorney again, right? And for 10 days you will have tribulation, but be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. This is the greatest example of the love that is shown to us. We are pardoned, we are clothed, and we are crowned. You know, this time that we are in right now is Lent, traditionally in the church. It is a season of introspection, of looking inward, especially at the sin that is in our life, the planks that are in our life, the things that stand in our way from receiving at that closer, intimate relationship with Jesus. You know, as uh, a church calendar, as we head closer and closer to Easter, and, and having that Resurrection Sunday, first comes the 40 days of intro introspection that mirror the days that Jesus spent in the desert before he began his ministry. Take some time between now and Easter. Take some time for reflection. Consider the planks that are in your life. Consider the judgment that sometimes is in our hearts and ask God to fill you with love for all people. Probably people that you could picture or that group of people that you call by name. Ask God to fill you with love for them. That as you head to Easter, that you shed away all the sin, that you receive all the love because one day we receive the crown. Let's pray together. Lord, even now we thank you for Easter. We thank you for the cross, for resurrection, for new lives, new garments, and a crown. Lord, we thank you that your grace and mercy covers all. We thank you that your righteousness brings peace. We would just ask that you would fill each one here with love for their neighbor, love for the world. That when others see us, when they hear our message, they hear you, that your gospel is peace, your gospel is love. May your church, churches everywhere, be filled this Easter season. May there be no more seats. May the world seek out that thing that it needs the most, your son and his grace. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and uh, celebrating with us this morning. Thank you for hanging out with us. Of course, I would remind you that we have church services on Sunday. We have a 9.30 service with a choir. We're going to sing traditional hymns out of the hymnal. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have communion. We're going to do responsive readings. It's going to feel exactly like church where you grew up. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. We have a worship team. Please come however you feel the most comfortable. And we've got a full children's program from nursery all the way through high school. And we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.